Welcome to another episode of the Written Advantage Success Stories from Financial Advisor Authors. And I am very excited today about my guest because this is one of my clients and I have worked with him for quite a few years now. So he is very good writing books. So he has quite a few books here under his belt already. His name is Dan Caprill. He is a leader in the financial service industry. Dan is a prolific writer and communicator. He's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Investors Business Daily, USA Today, and the Cincinnati Enquirer. Committed to the art of holistic planning, Dan emphasized the need to view personal finance similar to achieving and maintaining good health. What works for one person can be fatal for another. It all begins with a thorough and detailed analysis of one's current strategy and must address all areas. Known for his polite candor, Dan refuses to engage his clients in speculative strategies like stock picking, market timing, and cryptocurrency. His practice is best suited for those who seek an advocate in all areas financial. Now, Dan is the author of several books, many, and I'm going to read to you what he's the author of. Advisor Architect, Building the Practice You Always Wanted, Diffuse, Seven Steps to Protecting Your 401k from the Ticking Tax Time Bomb, Renegade Advisors, Surviving an Age of Amazon, Advisor Voodoo, Mastering the Dark Arts of Practice Management, Suddenly Single, A Widow's Guide to Secure Retirement, and Suddenly Single, A Divorced Woman's Guide to a secure financial future. So welcome, Dan, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Mary Rose. It's a pleasure. I think your um, your listeners need to know that the reason that, and I've told you this before, the reason that I'm a client of yours is because you stalked me. <laughs> That's right. I, in a very good and professional way, I might add, but you, know, well, <laughs> you determined that I was going to be a client, and damn it, you you stuck to that. And so, that's right. Well, because you were from Cincinnati, that's my oh, hometown. Oh, that what it was? Yes. And as soon as I saw that you were from Cincinnati, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, and especially because you knew who Dan S. Kennedy was. So yeah. when it was years and years ago that you posted on Upwork, I don't know if at the time it was Odesk. But originally Odesk, they switched their name to uh, Upwork. But I remembered when I saw that and saw that you were from Cincinnati, I was like, oh, my gosh. Because not everyone knows who Dan Kennedy is, although everyone should. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, you were from Cincinnati. And that was, that was great. That was, yeah. Uh, that, yeah. Was, that was great. So I'm, I'm happy to be on here. Thank you for uh, inviting me. You're welcome. Okay, well. There's like so many things. I mean, not only are you the author of books, you have written books for your membership program where you work with other financial advisors in helping them build their practice. So you're like a huge advocate for writing books in order to, you know, basically get, you know, get more leads. Also, I want to mention you're the one that suggested to me that I should go into book writing for clients and mm -hmm. you I will always thank you for that oh, well, no, so well, I'm going I'm going to just come right out again well, and thank you yeah because well, it was 2019 well the truth be told everybody wants to say they wrote a book but most people are too lazy to do it so right, right. and then for years we you and I and others would talk about that guys it's not that hard and yeah. Still, there are people that it's not that hard. I still don't want to do it. So fine, then then create a done for you model and and do it for them. And then look, we all know that most of the celebrities and and well known people who write books don't actually write. Okay. Yes. They they hire ghostwriters or researchers, whatever, to to literally do the work. For them. So you're it's really no no different. At, and, you know, as long as you're, what, what I like about people working with you, why I've always referred to you is, is you know that the, the purpose of the book is to get clients. The purpose of the book isn't, unless you really want it to be, the purpose of the book really isn't to create some piece of academia that, you know, will be, you know, cherished for years. I mean, you can do that if you want, and that's, that's great. 
But most of us are not going to write a book for that reason. Most of us are going to write a book because we want to get business for it. And we want to establish ourselves as an authority figure in our industry. And that's really the power of writing the book. And if you understand that, it really does become a lot easier to write it. Right. Yes. You were, what you suggested to me when we were talking about writing a book, because I was explaining how much I enjoyed writing sales copy. And you said, and I've used this quote, by the way, many times, you said, if you think about it, a lead generation book is really one long sales letter. And you're absolutely right. And for those that are thinking about, you know, and I've explained, by the way, the difference between a lead generation book and just a regular business book, because you have to, I mean, and you already know this and it'll come up maybe further in our conversation, but you have to have some things in place in order for it to, to make it a lead generation. Yeah, you, you definitely do. And one of them is it's got to be enjoyable to read. Right. Because again, if the goal isn't just to sell the book, and quite frankly, you'll probably be giving away the book far more than you'll ever sell the book then the book has to be enjoyable enough to read, which means that number one, you got to write it in an entertaining manner. And number two, in very few cases, it should not be a very long book, which actually makes it even easier to write because now you're not being told, well, I, I got to come up with 400 pages. No, no. I mean, most of the ones I write are well under hundred. I think I've only written one that was over hundred and, and that's really by design because it's defeating the purpose of the book. To begin right. with, it is interesting though. Every once in a while, somebody on Amazon will leave a review and they'll say, well, you know, the, it was, it was a insightful book, but it was really just there to help sell his system. And I was like, good. You got it. You understood. So you did get some useful information from it. That's great. But yes, the purpose right. of the book is to sell the system. That's wonderful. I love it. So I. It sent you a bunch of questions. I know we'll get to some of them, perhaps not all, but I kind of want to dive into how you, I guess, how you discovered or how it came to you that, hey, I need to write a book in order to promote my business. Mm. So maybe you can start there. Like, what was the, I guess, the, the pivot point or whatever that kind of got you in that direction? Well, I, I would say for me personally, it always been an ambition of mine to be a writer. Um, I went to college at the University of Iowa specifically to do that, um, but I didn't have really the the artistic drive to do it. The, the starving artist uh, lifestyle was nothing that was very appealing to me. So while I honed my craft, I never used it in the way that I thought it would do it. So once I then realized that I knew stuff to write about, what what ultimately led to the writing of the book was my desire to show other financial advisors how to run their business the way I run mine. And that desire came because many sought me out for advice. When you're a financial advisor, you, you, you know, other financial advisors, we go to the same meetings and stuff like that. And especially early in your career, by the time you get to be my age, you don't want to go to them anymore. But early on, you go to a lot of these meetings and you make a lot of friends and invariably you're, sh you're sharing ideas, et cetera. And because I, I run my business in a rather unique fashion, a lot of people were seeking out my advice. So to create what is essentially an information marketing business, that's what advisor architect is. That's, that's the company that I created. You really always, you, you need to have a book to create, be the basis of your information marketing business. So we talked about Dan Kennedy. He's written many books that are the foundation of, of that. And that would be the formula that he would tell you as well. So it's commonsensical that you want to do that because you're positioning yourself here as this knowledgeable person who's going to show other people how to have something that you have. And the best way for you to do that without overdoing it is to write a book. So the book should not be all your secrets. No, because you want people to pay for those but it should be um, enough to get them interested to where they want to learn more. Yes, I, I so agree with what you just said, because I, when I've talked to people about writing a book, I said, you know, you don't want to give away everything 
a, you just want to give people a taste. You want to give them enough that, yes, it will help them. Well, but, and they don't want to know, know everything. Right. I mean, that's exactly. the other part. They, they, they really don't. They just want to be, it's a sales operator. Right. So they just want to be, they want to be able to connect and say, yeah, that's me. Or as I like to say, they want to be disturbed. They want to be disturbed to where you've got, you've piqued their interest and they want to learn more. And that's it. And that, that's really all that you're doing with that type of a book. I mean, there's many types of books, but I mean, the kind that I write, I mean, you know, the whole last chapter is all about how to get a hold of them. That's there for a reason. Heck, the introduction's about how to get a hold of them. Right. That's I mean, if you only read five pages, I want you to know how to get a hold of them. That's right. That's a big, that's a big part of it. Yes. And if you do this both in the beginning and the end, one thing, if you self-publish through Amazon wow. and that feature that they have, look inside, people yeah. could even see that information without buying the book. So I, t I tell people about that too. It's like, make sure that you have contact information, both, you know, they like to even put it in the middle sometimes too, but beginning sure. and end. So that if somebody is checking out that look inside, they can see, oh, okay, you know what? I think I just would like to talk to them right now, you know, right. or so. Yeah. And, and Nick, I will tell you that if you have a very good title and a good cover, you'll get books sold on Amazon, but that shouldn't be your primary mode of distribution, assuming that the book is a lead magnet. You should have other marketing in place where people can download the book or acquire the book. So for me, for example, if you go to dancapril.com, you can get two of the books in download format. Now that's a change from the way I used to do things a number of years ago. A number of years ago, you had to give me your mailing address and I would send you the tangible. And that worked very well. But in my desire to increase my list, I've gone now more to a, a free download. You still got to give me information. Right. But it's not as much as it would have been uh, in the past. But don't, my point here is don't just rely on Amazon. Right. Because again, assuming the purpose of the book is again, not to have some great piece of literature that gets turned into a movie, but rather a lead magnet. <laughs> then you need to have a plan in place to give the book away. Right. Whether that be you're going to get speaking engagements or you're going to run social media ads where people can do it. There's so many, there's so many things that you can do. And you could even, if you wanted to, you could just, like I said, you could do the tangible. The reason I was doing the tangible was I wanted their home addresses or their, their, their mailing address as well. So I could market to them through direct mail. Because one of the concerns I have is that if you become overly reliant on digital, you know, I get, I get so many emails. I just got, just the other day, I got one from, from Google itself saying, you know, we all have that junk mail email address. Google is going to shut it down unless I bought memory. Cause I don't take the time to clean it out. All the time. And I'm like, go ahead, shut it down. I don't care. There's nothing that goes in there that I could care, care about. Well, so if, if I had bought a lead magnet or acquired some type of a lead magnet and gave that as my email address. Well, now you've lost. Me. So having that other address is important. Yeah. Yeah. That's how has that been working for you? You were saying that you have it more now on your website, the free download. Have you seen it? I'm like, where does the traffic come? How, it, how are you getting traffic to your site? to, I guess, encourage people to do that? Yeah, no, that's a good question. The way that you do it is uh, you run an ad for the book. Uh -huh. So you, okay. you run an ad for a book on social media. And um, I still use Facebook. I think financial advisors tend to be on it. I personally haven't had a lot of luck with LinkedIn. It's amazing how many companies still want me to use LinkedIn. I, I have spent a lot of money and been incredibly unsuccessful because my attitude is just a bunch of hunters and there's a whole lot of prey out there. Yeah. Whereas like Facebook still has a lot of, and if you look at the age demographics, it's, it's like perfect. It's like people our age. So it's kind of a perfect thing to go for, but you can look, don't be relying on just even one platform. I mean, it's your creativity. If you, if you are targeting a certain demographic or a certain, let's say you're targeting a certain occupation 
Well, there are websites for that occupation. A lot of those websites will allow you to run banner ads and you could do it on your book. You could be on podcasts like this and promote your book. I mean, there's a lot of podcasts that, you know, they're, they're looking for people to interview. So those give you great opportunities for you uh, as well. I've always found that I think in my case, when you go to dancaprill.com and you download the book, you're also going to start getting my almost daily email. And that becomes a very shareable thing that you can share with others as well. So th there's really no shortage of the, the ideas out there that you can do. I do think a podcast like this is very wise. Uh, people find you on the podcasts. Uh, again, if you have, it's kind of almost like Amazon. If you have a creative enough title that you, you, you can get organic growth from it. I mean, I'm amazed at downloads that I get. And the only, the literally the only promotion I do of that podcast is probably one email a month to my list. And the amount of people that download it is far in excess of the list. So, right. So people will find you organically. Yeah. There's a long tail effect, I think, with the whole, like the podcasts. Too. Yeah, there, there definitely can be, but you got to be willing to stick to it. You know, there's a lot of podcasts out there that only went three, four episodes. I know. I know. Right? Yeah. So if, you, if you're looking to build a real following. So like advisors, there are some podcasts that target advisors. Not a lot. And mine's a little unique, largely because I'm always coming, I'm always pointing out the obstacles that our industry's up against. And because uh, I think in many ways, the the, in the companies that we work with don't always have our best interests at heart. They want, the reason I call it the Profitable Advisor Podcast is because it's almost like a dirty word. You shouldn't be profitable. You should just focus on growth. And I'm always pointing out that, no, that's BS. So they're hearing things from me that the normal mentors that they get in their industry uh, don't usually hear. So when they hear from me, they're like, I agree 100%. That's what I've been saying all along. Good. That's how you connect. If you can. If you can have a message like that, that's somewhat contrarian, but agreeable, you're going to create a follow. You'll also create people who don't like you. That's going to happen too. Right. Um, you know, you look at, well, the best example ever, I think historically was talk radio with Rush Limbaugh because he was attracting people who for years, said, that's exactly what the way I think. But there was also plenty of people who didn't think that way. And so you become a bit of a lightning rod. That's okay. As long as you have more friends than enemies, you will be good. Right. Good right. case in point with him. Well, I, as a matter of fact, I've gotten back to writing the book that maybe you may contribute to at some point, but it was the brand, you know, the branding message that I like to talk about and archetype, brand archetypes. And what you just described is, and I just wrote this actually because I'm working on a chapter about brand archetypes and one of my favorites is the rebel. So the rebel is the contrarian, you know, yeah. and that's one of my favorites too. Yeah. And the reason I like it is because it evokes strong emotions in people. And when you are able to do that, you can take advantage of that in order to position yourself in various ways. But Larry Wingett, is the big one. He was the one that I actually focused on, but he he's written some really wild books that have titles. I mean, I can't remember offhand, but some of them are slightly not safe for work, maybe to say out loud. So, but if you went to Amazon and looked up Larry Winget, W I N G E T, yeah. you would see some of these titles. But uh, you know, it just the like you said the. I think the important thing is finding your tribe in a way as some people have described it as where you're kind of like putting out your message and it's a message that are, that's for a particular group of people. And for those who either, you know, are turned off by it or whatever, it's like, okay, that's fine. You're not, you're not the droid oh, I'm looking for, you know? In fact, if you don't turn off some people, you're really not doing a very good job Yeah, because the appeal is going to come from a, not from everybody, it's going to come from a certain group. And you want that appeal to be very strong. And the only way that it happens is if you show courage to say what is right. So if you look at the political spectrum, 
okay, there's one candidate who loves to tell it like it is. Maybe too much so, but he does. And there's another candidate who doesn't like to tell it like it is. In fact, always wants to say, I don't know. Well, the appeal to the one who tells it like it is, is very strong. Is it enough to get him where he wants to be? Maybe not. But you know what? If he was selling a product instead of running for, for office, he'd have half the market share. Yeah. And in business, if you have half the market share, you're pretty big, right? You're doing pretty well. I guess your Apple, Apple probably has half the phone at least, but <laughs> so that's, that's the thing. Now, you know, there's a, there's, there are ways to do it. And, you know, I mean, one of my frustrations with Trump has always been that he, he goes a little too far, but for me personally, he, he supports issues that I like. So I'm willing to overlook a lot of stuff. Well, if you're willing to call it as you see it. So when I said things like your broker dealer and your turnkey asset manager and your, your insurance brokerage, they don't care about you. They don't care if you're profitable. In fact, they don't want you to be profitable because the day you become too profitable is the day you stop working. When I started saying that, people were like, your ears. They're like, you're right. I was like, you know how they're telling you to have staffs of 20 people? Why? Why? What if you had a staff of three and even if you had less business still took home more? Wouldn't that actually be better? Right. And as a business, of course it would be better. Right. But that's completely contrary to what those entities would ever want you to conclude. So they will create a definition of success or an image of success that requires huge amount of infrastructure and cost because it's advantageous to them. Right. And I was the one saying, that's all BS. Now look, if that's really what you want, if that's what makes you happy, fine. But me, I'm into simplicity. I want to be able to not work in my business. I want to work on my business. I don't even want to live in the same city as my business. And those were the things that you know, I profess that, that we're truly rebel, rebellious, right? You know, when you say that this company that you think is your business partner, your business partner, now, I'm not saying they're evil at all, but I'm making a, a very clear point that in capitalism, we seek our own self-interest. Now, that's not necessarily bad. In fact, I'd argue if you really understood what self-interest was, you would treat people incredibly well because when you do that, you benefit tremendously. But understand that just because they tell you this is the way you should do it, th that may conflict totally with your values. Uh, growth is a real big, and this is for any industry. If you want to have the next big whatever, great. But study the, the titans of industry and study their family lives. Study the relationships that they had with their spouses and their children. In most cases, those are horrible relationships. Not enough time. There's not enough time. No. Okay. So, yeah. So if that's what you want, fine. Just understand the cost. Because... I'm not saying one has to lead to another. I am saying it happens a lot. In your pursuit of something <laughs> really big and complicated, just understand there will be unintended consequences. And you just got to balance that out. And I was the one willing to say, you know, back then I was, I would say to advisors, well, if you took home a million dollars every year and it was recurring revenue and you didn't have to get new clients in, would that be enough? And they're like, yeah. And they said, well, well, give me a, would 700 be enough? That would be great. So what we did then is we said, okay, let's work backwards. Let's not try to hit some volume number. Let's work backwards to a profit number. And when you do that, and you, you will find it's not nearly as hard to do. But again, those companies in my industry, they hate that message. I mean, the, the very few who have welcomed me onto their stages, I won't say they've regretted it, but it probably wasn't the message they were hoping to hear. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of threw a monkey wrench into their, their plans, I guess. Well, they should have read the books before they, they hired me. <laughs> I like it. I, like I always it. say, I always say present company probably excluded. Right. I love it.
So the books that you have written, I know there's actually, you kind of have two audiences for your books as far as, I mean, what it looks like to me. So can you explain the audiences for your books and how, if there's a niche there or how do you, how do you define it? Yeah. So as it relates to the individual um, client for the financial services firm that we have, Money and Clarity, there is a, um, there's one book we wrote, um, Diffuse, and that, that is really to attract people with large 401k accounts because a lot of them are unaware of the possibility and the likelihood of tax rates rising in the future. And so while they've been deferring the tax on all this money all these years, that may turn out to be a bad strategy. So it's a bit of an eye opener when you explain the demographics. So when I'm trying to build my list for the firm, that's one book that we've used. And, and we would have a, um, in the retirement rescue toolkit or a tax free retirement toolkit is what we market. That's a box and you get a whole bunch of materials in there. Um, the other one is when we made a decision about a year ago that all of our marketing efforts were going to be directed towards women uh, that we recognize that women were, um, kind of a, a sector of the market that was been ignored, which is really weird because of the majority of the, of the market, but there's also huge amounts of assets that are transferring to women uh, through the aging, the baby boomers. And the reality is that most women will die alone, like 80%. So that became something that we not only um, felt was a strong reason to market them, but that became something that we wrote about. And that has been a very well received message. So when we do marketing events that are women only events, not only are they always fully attended, the, the women always bring somebody with them because in very few instances, women, women tend to be very social, much more than men. And so they will tend to want to bring somebody to go. The thought of going alone, they're not comfortable with that in most cases. So that is, so those books are for the consumer and that's what we use to build our list for that firm. The other books, um, advisor architect and, um, advice of voodoo and some of the others that we've had, those are really for advisors. And so what we're trying to do there is, um, is get them into our system so that ultimately we can encourage them to, to join what is we call our advisor preneur program, which is a 12 month training program where they work with me and they, they learn the systems of running their business the way I run mine so that they can be more profitable and not have to work as, as hard. So those are the strategies in play here. So there's two very distinct markets that are in hand. Now, when we, uh, when we bring somebody on to the advisorpreneur system, we basically give them the books that I've written to grow my advisory practice, but we, we help them customize them so that they become their books. I'm not into licensing a book because I don't want advisors all over the country calling it their book. You know, I, I don't want them getting in trouble with regulators and it's not accurate. But if you wrote a chapter to a book that I already wrote, well, then that's a brand new book. And, you know, we'll put your name in bigger print than mine. We'll reveal me because again, I don't want you to get in trouble. There's no reason to. Um, and, and so that's what we'll do there. So you're the sidekick in that way. I guess. Yeah. But it gets back to this issue. People don't always, they want the end result. They don't necessarily want to do the work. So exactly right now, some things in life, you can't get away with that. So if you want to be a gold medalist in, right. in sports, you got to do the work. But there are other ways that you can shortcut that system. And, um, uh, again, as long as you're not trying to write a huge piece of academia, that you know, great American novel or something like that, then, you know, cause again, the formula for writing a sales letter is pretty clear. And if you're, and if you don't find yourself want, find that enjoyable, whereas you and I actually find that stuff enjoyable for some crazy ass reason, we're like, Oh, this is nice. Look at this. Look at these bullets. Don't ask why we think that way. We just do. We're nerds, I guess. Um, well then there's avenues for that. And so people like you are really well attuned to, to showing that to somebody and saying, look, if you want to tap that market, you got to be different than your competition. So let's take, let's take one of the most prevalent occupations that I see all the time, real estate agents. I mean, they're, sorry, they're a dime a freaking dozen. How the internet hasn't replaced them is beyond me. But if I was a realtor, I would definitely have a series of books because what greater way to increase your list if you wrote books like, you know, how to get 40% more on the value of your home, 
or you know how to I'd even go as far as say how to sell your home without a realtor. And it would be a book that would talk about how hard it is to do it. Very good. And then why Very you fun. really don't want to do it, but that would be the title for it. Right. Right. I mean, so many things that you could, you could do. You know, if I had another 50 years, I'd probably create advisor architect for other industries. But because again, it's a simple formula to do it, but whatever industry that you're in, you want to distinguish yourself from the others that are out there. And a book's just the best way to do it. Right. But it's got to be the right kind of book and it can't be, can't be boring. It, it's got to be a book, like I said before, that's enjoyable to read that that's, well, if it's enjoyable to read, it's probably quick to read. And that is ultimately a sales letter that motivates them to some action. Yes. So. I wanted to talk to you about your writing process because I don't think I I know this and I'm not quite sure if you have a regular schedule, regular things you do, but when yeah. you do sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write a book, Yeah. what is your process for actually getting it done? I have a very specific outline for what I'm going to do. I mean, each chapter is pretty much laid out in advance, you know, how it's going to do, and there is a set you know, formula for that, that really does help me in the writing process because I actually, you know, one of the few things people struggle with is, well, I have so much to say, I don't know how to put it in order. So it, it really does help to have that outline in place. And then the other thing, and this is the most important, is you must put yourself in a distraction free environment, whether that be for one hour, or 24 hours. That's up to you. I don't advocate 24 hours. I advocate maybe one hour a day, two hours a day, but totally distraction free. No cell phones. No, no one gets a hold of you. Okay. So I would usually do mine in coffee shops in faraway towns. Okay. I'm not going to run into a neighbor. Uh, no one's going to get a hold of me. The phone is in the car. And if you're panicky, oh, someone's got to get a hold. No, no. The, the the species survived for a long time without cell phones, okay? So, you know, in the, in the good old days, if uh, if someone had to get a hold of you, they just called wherever you were going to be at. So fine, you can tell them. I always I laugh at these. I see it say these parents, adult children, and they're like needing to, you know, I've got to know. My kids have got to be able to reach me. No, they don't. No, they, they really do not. That's your little control thing. You need to get old. And you know what? If they really do, I hate to tell you, you did a pretty shitty job raising them. So you probably want to fix that. I digress. Put yourself. I'm emphasizing this because people right away are going to come up with excuses. I can't put myself in a um, distraction-free environment. Yes, you can. That's right. And you'll Absolutely. be the better human being for it. The world will not end. Right. The world it will not end. It well, will not. Me, your loved three. ones, I am almost positive, your loved ones will not die while you are there. Okay? Right. If right. I'm wrong, it's probably because your loved one was dying anyway. But maybe you wait till that happens. But let's let's leave out. Put yourself in distraction-free environment. Have the outline. Write. But understand this. Whatever you write the first time will be terrible. Terrible. That's okay. That's what rewrites and edits. And that's why you work with people like you is helpful because you can fix it. Right. 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 So that's, that's the process, but it really is a distraction free environment. Now for me, what works best is, is when I'm really feeling creative, that's usually when I will kick into some level of insomnia, but it's not a bad thing. Um, and I will be writing at two, three in the morning, which is a very distraction free time the day in case nobody knows it. When Emily Dickinson did her best work was at two, three in the morning. So. I did not know that. No. I have a book of, about writing habits of different well-known authors, and it's interesting to see how Thomas Wolfe wrote "Standing Up." Was that in yeah. that book? <laughs> yeah. And I think Maya Angelou, she would go to a hotel with a bottle of scotch, and I forgot what else she had, but it was like always she had her liquor to write her poetry. You know. She was Robert Piercig, who wrote a book called, uh, it's kind of a famous book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. 
he would write his book in a camper laying down on his back with the typewriter on his chest. Oh, my goodness. Don't that does ask not me. sound comfortable at all. That, 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 seems, uh, that seems weird. But, of course, you know, if, if you're comfortable doing it, I'm not. But, you know, you can, you can just talk to your computer. I mean, the, the technology is so, I mean, back in the old days, well, you know, use a tape recorder. You don't have to do that. I mean, my, my Mac, I could just talk to it and it will transcribe whatever I, I do. But I have to have my hands on the keyboard, which actually for me took a while. There was a time when I could only really write with pen and paper. And um, I had trouble transferring ideas to the keypad without that little and that's because that's the way I learned how to write as a kid, right? We didn't have right. these type, we didn't have laptops. So, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of the process. Have the outline and put yourself in a distraction-free environment and understand whatever you're going to write is probably not going to be very good, but that's okay. It's the starting. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I don't know. Have you ever heard of the Pomodoro technique? Hmm. Okay. It's, um, uh, was based on somebody i believe an italian man kind of put it together but he was using he used a timer in in his kitchen he had this timer that was in the shape of a tomato so pomodoro is i, I, italian. I am i am familiar with this okay yeah. yeah yeah there's a productivity worksheet that i i used to use i had to stop using because they stopped making them and they only got me like 10 sheets left but it was done using the little tomatoes. And as you, as you assign time commitments to certain tasks, you would, you would check off a tomato. So, um, yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever works, but you've got, you, you cannot multitask. Well, as soon as you try to multitask, you, you waste time, you waste energy. Your brain needs time to shift from one context to the next. Don't do it. Focus Absolutely. on that one thing. And, um, your brain, yeah, this is a very simple fact, but I can't tell you how the, much this has helped me personally in many ways. Your brain can only hold one thought at a time. That's it. You can't hold multi-thoughts. Now, you can let new thoughts in and old thoughts out. But the whole idea behind meditation is to focus on one thing. So you're either focusing on your breath, and every time a thought enters, you go back to literally feeling your diaphragm pull the air and for, forcing your, your lungs to expand. So if you're stressed out about something, that's what your thought is. And if you took the time to shift that, to think about something else, you'll forget. That's why one of the most anxious times of my life, I got through it. I always say I watched um, Everyone Loves Raymond and King of Queens reruns. That got me through it because I was watching them. I wasn't thinking about the props, right? Right. So, in it, so why am I going off of this? I'm saying this because this is why you have to be in a distraction-free environment for you to get that work done. Right. Because your brain can't multitask. It can't. And this is how people get caught up with getting anything done today. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. So, like, a normal day for me when I'm working, is I have to I have assigned very clear time blocks for certain tasks, and the amazing thing is I always find myself getting it done at hand. So if I say okay, I'm going to give this from nine to ten, I'm done at nine thirty. Well, whatever I was going to do at ten, that now moves up, and then the next thing I know, it's noon, and I'm like, I'm done. So you know that's been the key to getting stuff done and and doing a lot. Uh, and, and, you know, we've had to create a lot to create the advisor architect company. There's a lot of things involved. And the way that was done was by being very disciplined in how I was spending time each day. Exactly. To do exactly. It. I'm a big fan, by the way, of time blocking. That's how I, that's how I do yeah. my day. I mean, I, just, you, you know, you know I, weighing it and you, yeah. And you know, it gets yeah. shit, you know, this is why I always like to tell people, look, if you're going to like when you and I have done things together, I always say, well, let's let's have a meeting every Monday, even if we don't have anything to talk about, just to kind of keep it on the agenda. Right. Otherwise, things drift away. It's true. It's true. And yeah, when you when you make an appointment with yourself, it's something else I encourage people who write a book. I say, make the appointment with yourself and make sure you put it on all your calendars so that nothing else gets scheduled in that spot. 
Yeah. You know, because it's a easy. Lot of, you need discipline too, because it's easy to cancel an appointment if it's just with yourself. It's, yep. It sure you is. Can't do it. You got to, I always say you've got to treat it like um, dialysis. If you ever know anybody who, who's gone through kidney dialysis, unfortunately, they don't miss that appointment. That's right. If somebody says, hey, you want to go play golf? And they got the dialysis appointment, they don't play golf. No, that's right. Well, I, you know what? It's funny you say that because I created a meme or, or, well, carousel, I should say, for LinkedIn, because you can do this if you do it as a PDF. So I create these images and then save it as a PDF. But what I said was treat your appointment with yourself as though you're showing up for a court date. So yeah. if you're going to, you're going to show up for a court date. You're not going to like, you know, blow that off, you know, so, shouldn't. so Some yeah, people you should do, but <laughs> that's true too. That's that true too. advisable. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, what the one other question here that I have that I was curious about your answer to is what would you consider your biggest obstacle to writing your books? Well, you know, I don't write them as an occupation. You know, I don't consider myself that that's my job. So I'm not writing them specifically to to make money. The biggest. So I've never said I don't put a quota on myself or anything like that but i will say as one who writes a a print newsletter every month and that's usually around three thousand words you're always going to be challenged with what i'm going to write about next because you can write so much and then you're like okay put a fork in me and i'm done but reality new ideas come up so you have to constantly be looking for those ideas i don't Knock on wood, I don't even like to say this, but I, I don't really get blocked much because I write the way I talk and I can usually come up with an opinion that, you know, you can go with. But if you have to be prolific, and I guess for me that the newsletter would be the most prolific thing that I do that I get paid for, it's trying to come up with ideas. Now, if you read enough subscription newsletters like I do and like you do, you will invariably find they're kind of saying the same thing issue after issue. They're just saying it differently. So my point is that's okay if you're being repetitive to something you wrote two years ago. That's okay. Just write it differently. Right. And you can come up with ways to do that. But that I would say that is sometimes my biggest challenge as I get towards the end of the month and I realize, okay, the muse has not inspired me yet. I need to now wake her up and find something uh that would probably be the, the the biggest challenge but otherwise like if i know what i want to say i don't really find like the book writing part i don't really find that to be that hard because okay this is what i'm going to write about now and and my style is one where i like to tell a lot of stories so they kind of uh, they kind of write themselves if you're if you're telling stories i i love i get your newsletter and I absolutely love it because yes, you you know, you do tell great stories and you add your observations or thoughts from things happening in your life. And then yeah. you relate them to whatever the topic is for that. Well, that, that's an important thing. I want to emphasize that because if you're, if you're trying to, like you said before, build a tribe, you're going to want to make your personality something that they can attach themselves to. And, and so that works really well. I don't do it out of ego. In fact, I think I'm probably more self-deprecating than anything else in what I write, but people kind of want to know that stuff a little bit about you. And if you're comfortable doing it, I mean, I've shown all my warts, you know, from my, my struggle with anxiety to yeah. other problems yeah. that I faced sure. in my life. So I want people to know that, you know, I'm a human too. And, you know, the only difference between me and anybody else is I probably, I just didn't quit. Whatever it was I was trying and I failed at, I just kept going. And then eventually I got it right. But that's it. I wasn't born with, you know, any more smarts and I really no connections at all as far as I'm concerned. I just quitting was an option because of what what was what was the alternative? Go work for somebody? Didn't couldn't, couldn't found it. <laughs> I done it. 
and I hated it. So. Right, right. Well, you're you're an independent thinker, and I'm an independent thinker. And when you're independent, and you also want creative license, that's probably the biggest thing that I love about doing what I do. Yeah, is I can test my own ideas, and yeah, no one's, no one's going to gonna say no. That, exactly, yeah. and that is so huge. It's it's funny. I um. I spend a lot of time volunteering at a, at a county run animal shelter. And I, and I really love the time I spend there with the animals, but the people over there who run it, they hate my guts because they don't think in a bureaucratic way, the way they do. Right. And so, you know, fortunately for them, I've raised a lot of money for them. So they, they have a reason to put up with me, but I am this mindset that they have, and you know, it's just so contrary to how a business would do things. And and it just reminds me, their their solution to every problem I have ever raised is let's have a meeting and talk about it. No, I'm not having a meeting. Okay. I don't do meetings. I'm sorry. I was we to think about how to solve it now. Exactly. I was once invited. I was once invited to a meeting. In fact, really encouraged to attend a meeting here in my community development. And I saw the list of people that were going to come to this. And I saw what the agenda was. And I'm like, I'm not going to this meeting. And, and the simple reason is, number one, I couldn't bring anything new to the table. And number two, to sit there and have to listen to this stuff get hashed out, there's no freaking way I'm doing it. So. So the guy who runs the meeting sees me one day and I had never even met him and he introduced himself. He obviously knew who I was and he's going on about how he wishes he, he was at the meeting. And I said, Ron, the reason I became self-employed is that I would never have to go to a meeting again. <laughs> yes. You are a man for my own heart. I, I can't. Obviously we have meeting. to meet with clients, but you know right, that right. 10 people deal, deal, you know? Right. Nope. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I've got some more, few more questions here. All right. If you uh, were talking to a, a financial advisor planner who was considering writing a book, what would you say to them to encourage them? So to motivate them to actually do it? Yep. To do it. It would, it would just be the fact that very few advisors will do it. And so there is a celebrity aspect that you can have as a financial advisor if you take the time to do it. And the book would be the first step. So if you had a book, you could actually go to radio stations and get interviewed. You could go to TV stations and get interviewed because they like that stuff. If you want, I mean, listen, there's like, I don't know, 30,000 of us, 300. I don't know how many. There are a lot of financial advisors. But there's very few that have taken the time to write books. So I would say that would be the reason to do it is to distinguish yourself from all the others. Now, the big challenge is for you to try to write a book that no one else has written before. Don't write a boring book, right? Uh, don't write the book that Dave Ramsey already wrote, but, but write a book. And, 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 you know, the thing to do it is if you can, if you can forewarn about a potential problem, that will, that will create a lot of interest. Just be sure you're accurate. Don't be like some of these guys who predict the Dow's going to crash and it doesn't. Because predicting bad news is definitely going to be more attractive than good news, but you got to do it in a way where your credibility is being hurt. So when I say to people, tax rates are going to go up, I'm not, I'm not saying it because I want them to go up. No, I'm just saying because I look at the population changes and I look at the size of our debt and I'm like, well, where's the money going to come from? So, you know, anyway, just, but that would be the reason. You want to separate yourself from all the others. And a book is one step towards doing it. You write the book that are automatically puts you in the top 3% probably. That yeah. have actually, and, and are still alive today. What about niches? Like, what, what would you say to a financial advisor about niches? I mean, I, I would definitely recommend that you, and you can write multiple books. You can write a book for each niche. But I definitely recommend that you try to position yourself as the go-to advisor. In fact, we have a whole program on that. Position yourself as the go-to advisor for a certain industry. So, for example, one of, the, one of the most successful advisors I've ever worked with only works with pilots. That's it. And, I mean, his business has just skyrocketed to, I mean, it's so much larger than mine now. 
it's when flying I met him, high. When I met him, he was a little fraction of mine, and now I'm a fraction of his. I'm so happy for him because this was a guy who was a pilot himself, and he went to the Air Force Academy, and he was a veteran, and he was flying for Delta, and he was doing financial advice on the side. And I'm like, I said, well, so when you're flying, you got a co-pilot? Yeah. And you're like, you know, and they're, they're, I'm sorry, not Delta, FedEx. So it's a completely different environment. Packages. For you. So it's just, there's nothing to worry about, but getting the plane. So like, you do realize every time you sit down, your co-pilot's a prospect, right? Now, don't be annoyed. But what if you had a book to give them, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, that really took off. And then he, then he expanded it. And now he's, he's, he's promoting his book and his podcast every week. So that is, uh, so that's a niche, right? Yes. We wrote Suddenly Single to, to attract the female market that very often becomes suddenly single. Divorce, death. When I turned 50, I was, well, I guess I was amazed. It was a little predictable. All these divorces that friends of mine, kids have finally grown up and now they're getting divorced. Death, the average age of widowhood, it's only 59 years old. I mean, that, when I read that. So, yes, niches. If I say this all the time to the African American advisors I work with, get Target. Other, well, they may not be. American, so I, I actually will say black people because I don't know if they're from Canada or where they're from. I always like to point out the hypocrisy of the word African American. I have a good friend from South Africa. He's white as can be. Became a U.S. citizen. He's an African. Yeah, that's true. People, people of color. That. People of color. If you there, are financial, you right, if you're financial, right. you you should target market people of color. Whatever. All right. Just make sure it's a niche that's big enough to feed you. If you're going to go after agents, you're going to have a hard time finding it, right? True. But yeah, I've used that line before. But if you're going to go at you, if you're going to go after a niche, just make sure that you can reach it. Like all the people say pro athletes. Okay. How are you going to reach the pro athletes? If you have an in, fine. Like I know another advisor, she only works with optometrists. How'd you get that? Well, that was her whole family background. And her dad, within the optometry world, is a pretty well-known guy. Perfect. She got on lots of stages, and she saw her niche. Her niche was really this. Her niche was, you're going to have to sell this practice someday, and you're probably going to sell it to one of the bigger chains out there. Do you have any idea what it's worth? And so she was very adept at valuing the practice for them. And then, okay, now what are you going to do with the money? Perfect. Absolutely perfect niche. There's advisors, I know one well, who only works with dentists, okay? So you want to stand apart from the others. The, the apps and online platforms are going to continue to take market share. But if you come across as the go-to person for a very sophisticated niche, then that won't be a problem for you at all. You will thrive. I like it. So what surprised you? Like when you started to, to publish your books, what surprised you the most about having those books published, introducing yourself as an author? Uh, what, what was the result or what happened that was something you weren't expecting? Well, it was a lot easier than I thought it would be, to be honest with you. Because it's not like the good old days where you either had to find a publisher or you had to buy 10,000 copies, have them delivered and stored in your garage. It's not like that. Either. So the simplicity of it and, and the low cost of it all. So the, it was great. And the ability to make changes was great. Oh, really what surprised me was the ease by which it is done. Super yeah. easy. Super easy. It's really, it's a lot easier. I know once I published my book, The Maverick Advisor, something that surprised me was the confidence boost it gave me because yeah. a lot of times you know when you're like neck deep and doing whatever it is you do whatever mm -hmm. your expertise is many times you you underestimate how much you actually know you know and so when i put it together in a book i was yeah. like oh yeah you know yeah. I, I actually do know a few things here that could help people well, you know, you know Let's face it, it's kind of cool when someone comes over to your house and you got it laying there. It yeah. just happens. Yeah. You wrote a book? Well, several, actually. 
Yeah, that's right. All yeah. that. That's nothing. That's yeah. nothing. You know, family man. Family member started late. Dan wrote a book. Yeah, I didn't get much recognition or acknowledgement actually from my family members. My dad was well, very no, proud well, of me. You're but not, well, my what, other you, family members, they were like, "Yeah, your your family's probably the worst ones because they are they knew you when you know." Right. And so you know that you know it's the old you know no one is a prophet in their hometown. So it's exactly. like, what the heck does he know? He's exactly. just he's just a guy from Nazareth. Nothing good came from out of Nazareth, right? <laughs> That's right. It's that type of thing, but it's when they don't know you before that suddenly it's like, oh, wow. But, you know, I mean, it is it is an achievement to be proud of. And I will say that whoever is listening to this and thinking, yeah, I want to write a book, realize that if you go the distance and you publish it all the way, and you're all the way yeah. to the end and market it, you're in a actually a rare area oh. of because... Not many people, I mean, so I meet a lot of people who say, yeah, I want to write a book and they don't do it. So when you actually finish it, if that is a huge achievement. Well, it and really it also is. then gets to the, well, why do you want to write a book? Because True. if you can answer yeah. that and there's, there's real meaning behind that, you'll write the book. But if you just want to write it because it'd be kind of cool to have that on your obituary, you're never going to get that book. Yeah. That's, most yeah. people, most people who take the time to be very prolific, there's just this burning passion in that to, to, to do it. And, um, right. you know, and that's why they're willing to, to live like in some cases that artist quality of life that I described that never seemed appealing to me unless they're just super genius. And there are those that are super genius. So it just naturally flows out of them, but you got to get into why, why do you want to do it? And then, and then what are you going to do with it? Because you're probably not going to write a, a real bestseller. You can have a fake bestseller. It's not hard to do on Amazon. But, I mean, you're not going to write, you know, the next uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. All right? Right, right? Probably. You're not. Yeah. So ask yourself, why do you want to do it? And that, if it's strong enough, will be your motivation. Yep. Right? Exactly. Why did I want to be self-employed? Because the thought of working for somebody was intolerable. Right. Okay. Yeah. As they say, find your why. Find your why. Yeah, I didn't want to go there because I think that's so catchy, but yes. Well, I still, I guess I like it because it's I still could write an entire book on just that silly con. I'm like, I know. And I have that book, by the way. I'm sure you I'm sure you do. Probably well, on my well, somewhere. I don't know. I have to look for it. So you're really, you're like actually one of the rare financial advisors I know who is very marketing very savvy about marketing put it that way so when you did put your books out there what were how were some of the ways you marketed your books and if you had media exposure how did you get it yeah i, I wish i had taken the time to to try to get media exposure it's it, it costs money because you got to hire a pr firm i did do that which got me a number of print interviews like the ones you cited in my bio those are all the result of a pr firm and yet you almost need that because it's, it's, it's tough otherwise. But uh, the way I marketed it was, no, I, I pretty much placed social media ads primarily in Facebook and, uh, you know, ordered the kit and uh, it was free. And because the topics were appealing, people did. And then I built the list from there and then I would invite those people to webinars, workshops, sent them an email almost every day. That's how you, you build it. I will say that I found that B business to business was more receptive to that than B to C. So if you are in B to B, you really want to do this uh, because I think you'll have really quick results. B to C, you'll have results. It just takes long. It's, yeah. It's too much, there's more competition on the, on the B to C, the B to B side than there is on the B. Well, also the whole shock and all box is, mm -hmm. you know, I've talked, to people about that, you know, using yep. your book in and then the giving them more than just a book. Yes. Right. Yeah. So it's a, you know, and we've, we've evolved with that to, to where we went from a dumpy box to now something that's really pretty. And especially for the women market, when we did the women market, okay, we can't send out the crappy boxes. We got to okay. make it look really very appealing. And that's, and that's what we've done. So, so yeah, 
The other thing too is your book is a great referral tool. So make sure that all your clients have multiple copies of it. And I always tell them, look, if you just, if you know somebody think we can help, just give them the book. You know, that's it. Just give them the book. Everything they need to know about me is in the book. I'm not going to bother them. They'll call me. And they do. Because, well, I got your book and I'm really interested. You and I can work with the person who wrote this book. Yeah. So. That's right. You're the celebrity. As I, which, as I, yeah, you're slightly famous. <laughs> I have a friend, I have a good friend, really good friend who has a radio show in a small town in, in Northern Michigan that he pays to be on this radio, to, to have this show. A lot of money too. He's a freaking celebrity in that town. And I go, if they only knew the truth. I mean, I have been with him in restaurants and they'll hear his voice. And I guess they can, they can, they can pick it out and uh they're like aren't you the guy on the yeah that's me oh wow really i enjoy your show and i'm like i'm rolling my eyes well the beautiful thing too and i love this is i'm the one who told him to do the show and <laughs> uh, so he comes back all the time so he has the best advice you ever gave but he lived in the perfect town to do that radio show right and uh so if he lived in detroit i probably didn't recommend it but this small town that he's at where everybody hunts and fishes, and that's what he does. And here is the, you know, he's got a downtown of this little town, financial advisory business. I said, oh yeah, you got to be on the radio for this, and and you get on the right station too. And he is, so it worked out quite well. Well, that's good. Well, where can people find your book? Well, the best way to go, just go to. You, I mean, obviously you can go on Amazon like everybody else, and that's fine. But if you don't want to pay for at least two of them, go to uh, dancapril.com. That's my name, Dan, and Capril is C-U-P-R-I-L-L, dancapril.com. And you go there, and you'll be able to download two of them, and you will get on my almost daily email list. And uh, but yeah, if you want to know more about that, especially if you if you're more interested in like you know personal finance issues and stuff like that, um, you can go, you can get them on on Amazon. Very good. What about speaking engagements? Do you do that? You know, I was doing quite a bit before COVID hit. And uh, and now I don't know if I'm going to do any more. I got enough things going on right now that uh, there, there there could be a couple of issue items in the legal world where I might. Um, one of the things that we do is we show attorneys how to add financial services to their business. So to the extent that there there are, there are some perhaps some opportunities there we might explore uh, going forward with it. But uh, you know, I encourage people to do them, but whether I do them or not, it's hard to say right right now. We do, though, do, my son and I do live workshops all the time on financial uh, planning for women. So those those are done quite often. Right. Okay. Well, very good. Well, that's, I'll tell you, I don't, this was so enjoyable. And I want to thank you again for being my guest and oh, it's my pleasure. just uh, sharing your story, sharing your experiences, because the whole point of this, special series is to encourage people to write a book and to show right. them and that there is so many benefits to doing it just do it so so thank you dan My and uh, and will uh i will be posting this i'll let you know when i post it and thank you listener for listening and if you have any questions of course you can always reach out to me also regarding writing your book take care